So hello, my name is Victor Blanquier, and uh, I'm an art director, currently working with Mojang Studio since about two and a half years back. And uh, as uh, you just mentioned, I'm going to talk about developing key art for games uh, today. Looking a little bit at uh, sort of the lineup for today, uh, it's, um, I'm going to start with an introduction on the topic, like what is key art for games, and then we're going to deep dive into like a few themes, and uh, they're informed by uh, the key art development on three games that I've worked on. Um, so creating signature elements, uh, Battlefield 4, uh, anchoring the key art to game pillars, uh, Star Wars Battlefront 1 came out in 2015, and then creating consistency through familiarity, through um, that was for Star Wars Battlefront 2. So, um, gonna start a little bit about uh, myself. I was not born on a burning battleship in the South China Sea. <laughs> I was born and raised in Stockholm, in Sweden. Um, and I was super into games and films from a pretty early age, so I made like high eight movies with my friends and, and kind of played a lot of games on uh, my Amiga 500. And that's kind of also how I started dabbling with computer graphics. So uh, I had this program called Deluxe Paint, uh, which, you know, started using to, to create like pixel art. Um, and a uh, little bit about kind of going into um, to games. Uh, I've been in games, uh, like console PC games, for the last 12 years. And I've had the privilege of working um, with a few different studios on multiple titles. So started out working uh, at DICE in uh, 2012, working on Battlefield 4, Star Wars Battlefront 1 and 2, which we'll get into more in depth today, uh, Mirror Search Catalyst, um, and then uh, consulting, freelancing with uh, Paradox Interactive, also in Stockholm on some of their external publishing games, uh, Space Sim, Surviving Mars, uh, Empire of Sin with Romero Games in Ireland, um, Bloodlines 2 with Heartsuit Labs, City Skylines 2, which came out fairly recently. I uh, worked on that with uh, Colossal Order. And then uh, I joined Mojang Studios in uh, 2021, so about two and a half years I've been there. Um, worked a bit on Minecraft Dungeons uh, in live service of that game, and then new and exciting things. Um, but before all this, uh, I, <laughs> I started my career doing um, like pixel art and game design for early mobile games. Uh, so uh, phones weren't that advanced back then. Uh, when the Sony Ericsson T68 came, it was a pretty big thing having phones with color. So we were super excited that we could, you know, not just make black and white web games like uh, this is Stockholm Skyline there for a game. Um, so yeah, very much like pre-smartphones, pre-app store, um, very fun times. Uh, I was working for a small mobile startup called Blue Factory uh, in Stockholm. And uh, I was 21, so as you can see, I was clearly developing as an artist and a designer here. It's like a diving game and a Viking game. Um, then I went abroad, uh, went to the UK, I went to London. Um, did my BA in art and design there, and I kind of brought the pixel art and the, you know, the passion for games. So. Um, uh, after graduating, I actually worked on this uh, TV show called Empire Square. Some people describe it as a British South Park. I think that's maybe giving it, I don't know, too much credit. Uh, but it's, uh, it aired late at night on Channel 4 in the UK. Uh, lots of swear words and stuff. And basically what got me that job is my graduate film from, from my degree. So um, uh, yeah, super into pixel art. Um, made a short film called End of Level, uh, had a friend who made the music with uh, Game Boy, 8-bit Game Boy, he had a cartridge called Little Sound DJ, you put it in and you make like chip tunes. And uh, I was also really into like street art, graffiti, always been into like graffiti and typography, so it was fun to fuse all these things. And then like an inspiration point for me, uh, like coming into that project is uh, a French artist called Invader. Uh, he basically goes around the world and he puts up like mosaics uh, of pixels from from different you know old school games um, and uh, yeah it's it's really cool he's very he's very dedicated and I think what I what I really personally admire in his work is like the level of consistency and perseverance and dedication and I think that's something you need as an artist to kind of find find your expression and then and then stick to it so yeah he's been to the Hollywood sign he's put it up there he's probably been to Lisbon because there's lots of 
street art here too in Lisbon. So this is uh, actually, is anyone from Lisbon here? Yeah, cool, we have a few. So you have some really lovely street art in your city. I was in, in uh, Portugal this summer and I just went around for dates in uh, Lisbon uh, just admiring street art. So it's, uh, it's, it's really cool. It brought me back to living in, in Hackney in East London where there's also, you know, it's very rich with street art and graffiti uh, and it's, it's nice. It's like a big, big outdoor gallery. Um, before all this, and um, before games, I um, also worked on art direction and design and motion graphics, but more, more in the kind of branding, uh, advertising, I suppose, sites. I worked in London and Sydney. And these are a the few of the brands that I had the privilege of, of working on back then with um, a few different design agencies like RGA and BBH. Um, these are some examples from like campaigns, uh, branding campaigns and experience that I worked on back then. And I think there's, there's a lot to be leveraged in like how you build consistency, how you connect with people through how brands in other industries uh, outside of games do it. It's a you know, different perspective, different way of thinking. So it's, it's something that I brought with me like coming into working with games. It's, um, yeah, it's important to keep like a different perspective, um, consider different angles, how others are doing it. Um, and then another thing I did back then was also working a lot with music artists. Um, I uh, worked at a design studio in London called Outside Line. Uh, so we did, did a bit of everything. We also did that pixel art show that I showed, uh, so TV shows, but we also worked a lot with like EMI, Sony BMG, uh, different music artists on like record covers, music videos, websites. Uh, so these are some examples. Uh, I was in my 20s back then. Not all have aged super well, but some, some I think are still pretty fun. And I think record covers is like an interesting area to study and dissect for like how can a single image embody and, and sort of represent an experience. So that leads us into what is, what is key art for games. And key art, um, cover art, it's usually like the first impression um, that you get from, from a, you know, a piece of art or a product, so it can be a, a record cover, it can be a book cover, it can be a movie poster, it's the first thing you see that's, that communicates that experience. And with, with record covers, I put some, some, some pretty famous cover here, you probably know some of them, um, probably quite a lot of them. Uh, and this is something that you know, was more popular before, it's not really survived as much into the digital era. Um, uh, but, you know, with Spotify and streaming services, they've kind of fused a little bit like music videos with loops, um, but it's not really central to the experience anymore. You don't go to a record store and pick up a record and then, you know, look at it and then maybe oh, I'm going to go listen to this thing and then buy it. So people listen less to albums, EPs these days. They listen to playlists. They, you know, create songs from different things. Maybe you get, you know, nice graphics. Uh, there's Kraftwerk there, Autobahn. They, they redid all their covers to be consistent for their, you know, six centerpiece albums. Um, but there's a lot of interesting things you can pull from, from looking how it's done here, like punk aesthetics, for example, with uh, the Six Pistols and the Clash, it's come to you know, really represent what, what punk music is about. Um, so then, you know, going into game covers, um, you can apply some of the same thinking to it. Um, and it's, it's at its best, it's uh, an iconic representation that appeals to the potential player and creates an interest to play the game. Uh, so these are some iconic covers uh, historically, in my opinion. And why are they great? Well, I think Super Mario Bros. down here, uh, they, they had this, you know, for the Nintendo 8-bit, they had this very consistent design formatting with how all the, the cartridges, all the boxes were laid out. Um, but they stood out very clearly and they kind of had this heightened pixel art, or like selective pixel art from the game. And then Grand Theft Auto, they've been, I think since three, uh, been super consistent with the design formatting. Um, they have these collage visuals, they show different characters, they show action elements, vehicles. So it's, it's, you know, it's very easy to see a Grand Theft Auto game in the, they sort of own that expression. Um, and then, Many of the covers here, they also have very strong logotypes, uh, like Final Fantasy or Quake or Doom, um, very iconic, um, or the very strong iconography, like Do uh, Mortal Kombat or Crazy Taxi, that also you know, have survived for a very long time. Or they have a, a unique illustration style, like Resistance 3, um, uh, that's very, you know, um, very unique and stands out. And then we have Metal Gear Solid 2 over there, which kind of is disappearing on the edge, but, uh, it's another nice one. 
Uh, and so in the early days uh, of video games, in the 1980s, cover art, it, uh, it basically had to do heavier lifting to you know, communicate like, what's an aspirational image, sort of letting the player imagine what, what the game experience would be like. Uh, so game graphics, as you can see, it was a bit more simple. It was restricted by hardware, like resolution, colors, rendering. So this is kind of, imagine what the experience would be like playing Gremlins. It'll be this, it's not, you know, four colors and, and these chunky pixels. Um, and one artist that I really admire, um, again, going back to like the Amiga era, which is what I grew up with, is this artist called Roger Dean. And he collaborated for a pretty long time uh, with a publisher called Psygnosis uh, in the UK. He also actually designed their logo, so he did all these covers, and I think in an era where you know many game covers were pretty forgettable, um, his designs and like logo work really stood out. And staying a bit with Psygnosis, this is uh, I think for me like a very iconic series of covers from Psygnosis. Uh, this was made by the Designers Republic for Wipeout, and you know it's uh, I think it's, it's at a time in the 90s where you know on the PlayStation One they brought in tech, like electronic music, they brought in modern graphic design. It's sort of you know, shifted away, like what, what you know, from maybe like making games less narrow and opening up to be like a broader expression. They also designed like all the the you know branding and logos and stuff for the different corporations in the in the game. So key art very much is about consistency, color, composition, um, creating iconic imagery. Uh, you want to stand out uh, among the rest. It's a it's a crowded marketplace and competition is pretty fierce. There's a lot of visual noise and impressions, especially in these days with you know, digital storefronts, social media, lots of ads. So, so how can you make your game stand out through, through the key art? So to summarize, uh, what is key art? It's the first impression uh, that most people would encounter of your game. It visualizes the essence of the experience uh, and its logotype, its color, composition, illustration, um, all these things combined. So let's talk a little bit more about scaling, creating scalable signature elements. And I'm going to deep dive into um, examples from Battlefield 4 here, uh, how we developed a key art for that game and how it fits in within the Battlefield franchise as a whole. So, yeah, that's good work. Cool. Has anyone played Battlefield 4? Ah, cool. There's a few. There's a few. Nice. Welcome. Welcome. Come in. Um, so Battlefield 4 just turned 10. Uh, so it's, it feels like a really nice time to talk about the game and share a little bit more from the development. It came out in 2013, in like late October. This is the final key art uh, for Battlefield 4. Uh, the development was led by a super talented concept artist uh, and art director now called uh, Robert Chamberlain. You should check him up on ArtStation or I think mostly ArtStation. He's, um, he's a very talented guy, super nice to work with. Um, I was also very much involved in different parts of the development of the key art, um, ranging from like the backgrounds, the logotypes, colors, UI, UX, uh, the visual design language for the game. Um, so really, really love this. was my first AAA game. Uh, it was a very fun collaboration with like truly talented people. I was the UI art director on the game. And so sort of moving backwards from the key art, um, one of the elements that we brought in and developed for Battlefield 4, it came from like a few different ideas and, and reference points. Um, this is an earlier iteration of the main menu background. So essentially the city from the main key art, but you know, we replaced the characters and the tanks and so on with the UI layer. And we were experimenting with this like shallow depth of field and bokeh. Um, and it's, you know, it became something that we started using consistently across the key art in and out of the game. So here it is with the UI layer, you know, you're looking through your unlocking weapons and so on. And um, yeah, we were, we were sort of looking into this bokeh element. So I actually <laughs> went down, I had an idea in my head, so I went down to the waterfront in Stockholm, like the dice office is just, you know, you walk down in Södermalm, you're facing the old town. So I was just, you know, went out and shot this on an evening used to have like, yeah, this is, this is kind of the space of mind that we're in. And just before starting at DICE, I made a short film um, for a design festival in Sydney, um, 
which had a lot of bokeh and CD backgrounds. So I actually showed this to the art director on the project, uh, Gustav, and he was like, yeah, this, I think this is an interesting approach, you know, with, with a bokeh. Um, and it also actually tied into um, uh, the game graphics in the game. So, so BF4, uh, it shipped as a launch title for new consoles in 2013, the PlayStation 4, Xbox One. And now the in-game graphics could also simulate a camera bokeh uh, through like using physical cameras, so like virtual physical cameras in the game, I suppose. And that kind of game, the game a more cinematic look, as you see, this is a screenshot from the prologue in the game. And it felt like this is a good red thread from you know, these high fidelity cinematics and screenshots that we have through to into the key art. Uh, and it works kind of consistently across all these elements. Uh, another element that we worked with was the iconic Battlefield glitch, um, which was seen in Battlefield 3 and 2042. Um, and for this, um, for this game, we were kind of looking at different analog approaches to do this. Um, these are some like macro shots another art director in the studio took. Um, he saw some of the things we were like looking at, and he was like, what is camera in? And like, his, uh, you know, um, macro lens and, and shot these. And we were like, this is a really interesting starting point. So we, we had this move board for the UI and kind of looking at things like surveillance cameras and analog distortions, like CRTs from old TVs. And basically the fiction that we wanted to build was that the UI was this broken military uh, system. So this then translated into like visual targets for the UI. This is the deploy screen where you spawn into the game uh, and then into like logo development. This is an example where we're kind of experimenting with, um, with the glitch in like a motion graphics test for the UI. You see some of those elements there. And um, then, yeah, for like other screens in the UI, we also brought in the bokeh, like behind the soldier. This one was rendered natively in Frostbite, a little bit later in, in development. And, but you know, we kind of realized like to get the right effect, really right, we, we had to get an old CRTV, like we had to capture it from an actual TV. So we went and got this TV and, you know, brought it into the office. It was super heavy, 28 inch, and then, you know, set it up at night. So it's, you know, no like reflections and glares on the screen. And then we started capturing like these rasters and effects and like analog distortions, like pulling the cable with a full frame camera. And then this kind of went into the, the logo type look. And as you saw, some of the, some of the UI look. Um, as well. And I'm going to show a little video. This is, some of this actually went into the, um, I think it was like the E3 teaser trailer. And um, you can also see like the glitch and the distort here, like in the element coming off the soldier. This is called the battlefield signature element. Uh, and it's kind of this orange bleed that's coming off the left side of the soldier on the cover. And these are the key arts, um, DLC key arts. Um, they also, you see, you have the same element used consistently with the, uh, the orange glow. So this was also made by Robert Chamberlain and the, the concept art team, uh, Eric Pashon as well, it's lots of talented people. Um, and if you look at like the lineup of Battlefield games from all the way back to Bad Company 2, up until the most recent ones. Uh, it's been like a super consistent signature element for the pack six mainline Battlefield games. This, uh, you know, orange bleed. So it's, um, it's easy to see that it's a Battlefield game. You have this very iconic element, the signature element. And um, to recap a little bit here, um, these signature elements, they, they provide consistency across multiple games in a franchise. Um, these well-considered elements fit different settings. Um, and then fidelity and finish and create, creative sensibility is what can um, set your execution apart. So Battlefield, um, I suppose, has always been more of like a European or Scandinavian FPS with very high production values, a lot of attention to detail, slightly more mature and refined audience. So it, you know, it sits, all these elements sits really well with like the audience that it's trying to reach. And next, um, I was it on BF4. I'm going to talk about anchoring key art to game pillars. So, so game pillars, I'm sure many of you are familiar with. It's something you establish uh, at the start of a project to, you know, to work out course of like what the game is about, being able to communicate it within the team. 
So I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, Star Wars Battlefront <laughs> uh, that released in 2015 now. And um, um, the, the overall pillars we had for the game were uh, accessible, um, meaning more the UI UX. Um, it was a shift going from the Battlefield franchise into Star Wars. Star Wars has, you know, a very broad audience, younger, older. Uh, so we wanted to make it very, very, a very accessible shooter, basically. Fun uh, maybe sounds a bit obvious, because games need to be fun, but uh, the fun pillar was the design. We wanted to make a very, very fun game. Uh, and authentic was the art direction pillar. Uh, so we, we only focused on, in the first game on the original trilogy uh, of Star Wars and kind of remastering that trilogy. I'll, I'll get in a little bit more to that. But um, leaned in a lot to photogrammetry, uh, one of the first games to um, use PBR. And then this came through in the key art through like iconic and, and premium visual design and key art. So um, yeah, the art direction of the game, it was all about lovingly updating and, and bringing the classic Star Wars, uh, you know, Star Wars, Empire Strikes Back, Return of the Jedi, bring it into a modern era. And the purpose of the art direction was not about reinventing or introducing change where it's not needed, but rather to focus on, on the quality of the, the visual execution. Um, so you have a lot of iconic and timeless designs in Star Wars from like the production desi design on droids, you have R2-D2 up there, stormtroopers, to very iconic typography, um, iconography, um, and it's the shape language that you have in Star Wars is, is it's super strong. You can easily tell that two circles and a line there, that's the Death Star. So it's, it's you know, you have this super strong face value. Uh, but it's also important to point out like we weren't going on a retro trip either. Uh, we wanted to, you know, look backwards, but then kind of bring it into the, the, the modern era. So um, the game development also leveraged a lot of innovative technology. Um, uh, one of the first games to use photogrammetry to recreate the, uh, the immersive world from Star Wars. And um, yeah, we really wanted to recapture like the analog techniques these movies were made by. They weren't made with computers. They were, you know, industrial lighting magic in an industrial warehouse in in Los Angeles, making models and props and you know these these custom camera things. Um, and also going to the actual environments um, and recapturing, um, you know, Endor or Hoth or Tatooine and bring it into the modern digital era. And um, yeah, just to call out the environment work was led by a very, very talented lead environment artist, uh, Andrew Hamilton. Uh, you should check him out too. He's super, super talented. Um, and yeah, so the artist went on location, uh, going to Norway and Hof and Death Valley for Tatooine, uh, Iceland for Solust, which was a new planet. Um, and yeah, we really wanted to capture the essence of this location, like translate them into the game. Uh, so that was... Real world Tatooine, this is in-game Tatooine. And then um, also did some kind of unseen, unexpected and unseen new additions to environments. So Tasmania had some of the you know, unseen parts of Endor, the, the forest planet from the Return of the Jedi. Had some ice caves for Iceland, for Hoth. And this is Endor from the final game. And then going in a little bit more to the key art, uh, this is like another kind of behind the scenes thing, but we, we really, really leaned into like recapturing the, the original elements um, uh, as well. So this is, this is capturing things actually for the, the menus in the game. We wanted to have you know, different elements from the game present. And since in a menu, you can turn up the, the quality a lot higher, uh, the meshes and the texture uh, resolution and so on. So we went in to get some more HDR uh, footage. This is from a small photo studio in, in, in Stockholm. We just went in and got some, some, some more material there. Uh, also, like, yeah, it's, it's cool. Use, I would say use the real world, um, study real life lighting, like going beyond the virtual, like helps to hide in the game. Um, and then we brought this into the engine. This is like a test from Frostbite. Um, and this also started to kind of inform the key art and the, the visual design for like the menus and the branding. So yeah, as I mentioned, like those original movies, they were made with analog technology, like optical compositing and so on. And we really wanted to recapture that authentic feeling, um, both in-game through photogrammetry and also coming through like in the key art. So this is the deluxe edition key art. So it sort of evolved into, into this and this is very, tight collaboration between um, the game team and the brand team at EA. 
um, creative director on the brand, uh, C. Lin. Worked, I worked a lot with him on, on this one, and he was a big part of getting this one made. Uh, and as you can see, there's a battle scene reflected here in the Stormtrooper Eye, which is the main um, standard edition key art. Uh, so um, the production of this one, uh, the standard edition, it was uh, Took a long time. Uh, There's a lot of stakeholder alignment, but uh, it's it's loosely based on like this idea that we had pretty early on in a small group uh, of artists in the team. We 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 were bouncing different ideas about like what could the key art be, like what could the, the image be, um, and we came up with one thing. Uh, we came up with many things, but one thing was this idea of David versus Goliath, like man versus machine, rebel versus empire. So um, these are. Some other posters, um, you can see an embryo of that idea here on the left with the rebel and the, the at-thats in the background. So these ones, I, I love these, these are team posters. Um, we have a, a super talented concept artist named Anton Grandet. Uh, he's still working on, on Star Wars, on the uh, TV shows and stuff. Um, but uh, we had these production beats, uh, so he made a poster for each one. This was also a bit of a, you know artistic study for him, he looked at a uh, an artist called Drew Struson, which I'll show a little bit more from. So in this first one, it was uh, big, um, big battles, you know, with X-wings and Atats and all that good stuff. And then we had heroes with Luke Skywalker, Darth Vader, Darth uh, Vader, Palpatine. Uh, and then the third one is, um, I think it's like the finish the game poster. So you have the production director Robert there. He's looking very. We need, to, we need to finish the game, we need to ship the game. Uh, so he's thinking deeply about getting all the battle plans together. Um, mentioned Drew Struzan, these are some examples from, from his work. Even if you don't know of him, you probably definitely have seen some of the movie posters uh, that he's made. He's made over 150 movie posters. Uh, and he has a very iconic style, um, using like acrylic paints and airbrush. Uh, doesn't do posters anymore, but you know, very, very lovely posters from 1980s, 1990s. Um, and then I'm going to move into Battlefront 2 and talk about consistent three, consistency through familiarity. Um, so one of the things, uh, like moving into the sequel, the next Battlefront game, is uh, we wanted to develop, um, I suppose, a more scalable signature, ele uh, signature element and then anchoring that to something that was familiar from, from the Star Wars IP. And I will also talk a little bit, of beer, uh, a bit about here about how we, uh, how we worked on the logo type and the typography development, um, actually across both games, um, to evoke familiarity through that consistency. So we have the standard edition here um, for Battlefront 2, and then the deluxe edition key arts. Uh, I worked as the 2D lead on the project, so I was very much involved with these and UI UX, brand design, um, Lots of other things. Uh, so let's let's go a little bit deep dive into the creation process of, of this key art. So Battlefront 2 uh, was built by three studios, DICE, uh, Motive, and Criterion. We were building on the multiplayer. It was the first game was a multiplayer game only. So we added a single playing campaign. We added all three eras, um, not just the original trilogy anymore, but all three movie uh, trilogy eras. Uh, so in the key art, you have Darth Maul. Uh, on the right, representing the prequel trilogy. You have Rey on the left, representing the, the sequel trilogy. And then you have Aiden Versio in the middle, um, the, which is also the hero of the single player campaign. And she's representing the original trilogy because the single player campaign takes place just after the events of Return of the Jedi. And as you can see, we have this holographic effect coming off uh, the characters, abstracting them a little bit. And that was also a technique to like abstract characters that exist in different um, time space from each other. Uh, so it was, it was an abstraction technique, but it was also you know, an effect that we could uh, use in other ways. Um, so this final image, uh, many, many different talented people, too many to, to name here and now, but, but to mention a few, uh, again, uh, Anton Grandet, uh, Yusuf McLamb, also concept artist, uh, very talented team at Goodbye Kansas in Stockholm. And a fun bit of trivia, uh, the poses on all the three characters on the cover is something we, um, we got some help from actually the lead 3D artist on the project, uh, Jessica Helgeson. So she's, uh, I think, a black belt in Kung Fu. So she's, you know, she did all the cool poses. Um, but coming in and like zooming in on the holographic treatment, this is like a very early exploration with the, the effects and the rasters. Um, we 
did a lot of iteration on, and tests on these, so I'm gonna kind of get into them. And in order to find something that felt familiar and could scale, we, we really like carefully sat down, studied Star Wars holograms to find like the right colors, the right rasters, distortion. So um, of course, like Leia in A New Hope, it's you know the first hologram. Um, people saw in a Star Wars movie, that was one key reference point for a few different elements. Uh, but then we had to be a bit selective looking at other ones. This is an example of the Galen Erso hologram in Rogue One, one of the newer movies. So it's, as you see, it has like more desaturation, slightly more high definition rasters, which we, we also kind of liked. Um, but holograms, they, they look pretty different in Star Wars movies and different eras, uh, like use cases, context. So we kind of had to synthesize and get like, what are the right reference points from each one for us? So you, you, know, you have green ones when there's battle planning, you have kind of less color, more color, desaturation and so on, and kind of depends on which era of Star Wars they happen in as well. Uh, so with all that, of course, we brought in a TV as well, because that's how these holograms were made in the original one. The previous TV was lost in the move, so we were like, damn, okay, we lost that 28-inch TV, we need to get a new one. So we got this tiny one, it was like a 14-inch TV, and we were like, this is too small, we, 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 need, we need a bigger TV, basically. Uh, so we, we got a big, bigger TV, we got uh, Sony Trinitron. If you're into retro gaming, I can recommend them. They're, for me, the gold standard if you want to play your Super Nintendo, Mega Drive games. They also have a flat screen. They don't have a curved screen like other CRTs, so it's, it's also easier to, um, uh, to kind of capture them with a the camera. And at first, as you can see there, the weird picture with the hand, we were like pulling cable and pulling things to get like these distort lines, and it was pretty cumbersome and pretty hard. Um, so I found like these guys on the web, or actually a guy uh, in, in the US, and he makes like something called opti glitch machines. Uh, and yeah, this gave us a lot more control and kind of deluxe options, like more inputs, knobs, you could like use these knobs to fine tune things. Uh, so they're, they're, they're kind of an analog engineering outfit in, in the US. They custom make these from old like vintage video processors that you can then use for synthesis, synthesis manipulation uh, called Tachyon Plus. So this helped us a lot to, to have more controls uh, rather than just you know, pulling cables, janking cables. Um, and you see an iteration here um, that we kind of liked, getting like more of the rasters and the effects and so on. Um, and then kind of bring it into, I mean, this is still pretty low res, but we're really, you know, testing things, um, getting different looks. So, you, you know, you get a lot of cool, cool looks just out of this machine. Getting a bit closer here, um, you know, in terms of like bringing in like more high res models uh, and so on. Um, and um, yeah, we were slowly, slowly, you know, through, through a lot of iteration, basically getting closer to this, where we, you know, landed on something that we felt that, you know, it can, it can work to the scale that a key art needs to be. Maybe it needs to be on, you know, on a building for a convention, it works in a small format. So we, you know, a lot of back and forth to get like the readability right, get the element right, uh, and then also have an element that we could then build out to use for, you know, um, for future assets, because it was, you know, we didn't want to have something that was just super, super expensive, super complex to produce for one image, but something that we could start scaling to like other elements. Um, so yeah, it took time uh, and a lot of iteration to find the right finish uh, and definition of the holographic treatment, basically getting the glitch effect right. Um, so here's another example from from the standard edition um, of more distorts, and then uh, another pretty cool one uh, from. Anton's portfolio, and then, you know, landed on this final image, final key art. Um, so, you know, the scalable element worked well. This is the celebration uh, edition uh, of Battlefront 2, so it carried across here, it carried across into, uh, like, other executions too for, like, in-game 2D art and marketing art and so on. So it's, um, it was really fun to develop, and it was, you know, even though the game is, uh, not being updated anymore. I think like for the lifetime, it's, it worked really well as a signature element. And then I wanna talk a little bit about typography and logotypes, because uh, this is something that's super, you know, really helps with consistency and familiarity as well. So for many people, this is the first thing, this is the first experience you have Star Wars. You sit down in the movies, this opening scroll starts, 
movie's going to start, you know, it sort of sets up the story. And this is, contains the Star Wars element that we wanted to bring into the design language of, of the game. So it's, it's a very familiar typeface that's used in these. Uh, it's universe. Um, we used the linotype version. So on, you know, on a subconscious level, many people have seen that scroll. You see the same typeface in the game. I mean, it's a widely used typeface, but when you pair it with other things, it becomes a very, very familiar uh, element. So this was used widely across the visual design for the game and the UI and the brand design. And then we paired it with Orbesh, uh, which is the, the kind of uh, you know, in-universe font uh, that you have in Star Wars that has the more alien glyphs. And you know, we wanted to, uh, this is one of the planet intros that we have for like when you start a multiplayer game. And um, we wanted to have this contrast in the typography between like the more modern universe. It's a, you know, um, very structured, uh, modern, um, grid-based typeface, sans serif. Um, but then having like this contrast with the, the alien type through, um, through Orabesh. And uh, typography, I think, is, is, it's the voice of your game, it's the voice of your brand. So it's important to spend time on getting the typography right because you're going to use it for a very long time in the game. And it's, it's important for readability and flavor and all those things too. So here's another example of how we used it in some of the menus, both the type and then holographic effect as a visual target for it. And um, also in the, um, this is some of the marketing examples. So we also looked a little bit more in the second game at kind of the CRT, like the computer monitors that you have in the, the shape language that you have in, in Star Wars. Um, and then going into logo types. Um, so, we have a lineup here. This is the original trilogy uh, logos plus Force Awakens over there, uh, just for <laughs> comparison to see how they, they evolved uh, the Star Wars logo, putting Force Awakens between the, the original New Hope logo. Um, so, of course, the Battlefront uh, game, and uh, I think most Star Wars games do this. Um, the new one from Ubisoft is kind of has the skewed, you know, out, outlaws, I think. Uh, it's got that Empire Strikes Back vibe going. Um, but we were inspired by one of them, and I think uh, you probably see which one, maybe Return of the Jedi or Revenge of the Jedi, as it was called. And it's, um, it's a pretty interesting story how, how we landed on that one. So I'm going to show a little clip. This is the first teaser trailer for the game. Um, and it's basically the game was going to be announced at E3. There were four people, or three or four people, working on it. So there wasn't a game to show, basically. Uh, but they were like, we, we want to have a teaser trailer for E3. So the art director, he kind of came up with this idea, worked with um, uh, a VFX house in Stockholm to put this together. But then he had to come up with a logo uh, to put at the end of it. And I think he just made this one super quick. And then, you know, it, 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 it stuck around. So let's check it out. So, um, yeah, Return of the Jedi. Uh, and this is kind of an evolution of, of the logo throughout the two games. We started here in, in the trailer and then um, included the EA logo. Um, there were multiple Star Wars game, uh, Star Wars game in production from, from EA at the time, so the Respawn uh, game that's come out now and had a sequel um, and so on. So we, we needed to also take that into account, how we kind of make this work within uh, a Star Wars franchise and an EA Star Wars franchise, so you know some back and forth there to kind of get it right. I think it's it's um, it worked out pretty well. That's kind of the more premium treatment uh, with some more metallic finish um, for some of the deluxe editions, collector's editions, and then for two, basically stuck with the same one. I think we tweaked some minor kerning and you know some nice detail polished, uh, put the two in, um, and then added this holographic treatment to the logo. So I want to show that quickly too. That's something where we were, you know, wanted to include that holographic um, treatment as well. Um, so we kind of 
we're slowly getting to the end of the presentation, um, and we're actually ending uh, a little bit on logos, but um, it's good to end on logos because a logo is incredibly important. Um, it's maybe the most important asset you have to communicate what your, your game or your brand is about. Um, so let me show you the... No, this is... Uh, so yeah, we did this test, we were like, whoa, this is too, a little bit too low res, this is a bit too, you know, old school, retro, we need something that has more of that high def that we have in the key art, so, so yeah, we did another style frame, we were like, oh, okay, this is cool, this is, you know, this is feeling a bit more and more high def hologram, and then, um, again, worked with Goodbye Kansas, um, collaboration with them to produce the actual, like, logo animation that was used in trailers and, and so on. Yeah, so that's um, coming to the end of the presentation. Uh, and to summarize, uh, the Battlefront 2 and the Battlefront games, consistency and familiarity can really scale your, your key art. You need to ultimately consider how, how all these things work together, the key art, the UI, UX, the colors that you use, the palette for the game, uh, the typography, the, the iconography. All these things, they work together to communicate what the game experience is out of game when, when people see it in marketing and on storefronts and then, you know, consistently, if you do it well, as a red thread through the game. So there's, you know, difference, no difference between what you see on, uh, on an ad to when you're opening up a menu or like playing the game. Um, typography is your game's voice. It's a good one to repeat. Um, I think it's uh, typography. They're not just fonts. They can be used in incredibly powerful ways. Ask any graphic designer. They'll talk for a long time about typography. But spend some time thinking about type. I think it can really help set your game apart in, in combination with all these other elements. And then finally, the logo type is probably your brand's strongest asset. It's gonna, if you get it right, it's going to live for a very long time. So spend time to get it right um, because it's quite costly to to come up with a new rebrand or a new logo for your game. You want to kind of get it right from the start. Um, and um, yeah, to make it meaningful and powerful and lasting, you can you know, create a strong red thread through all these things, your, your key art illustrations, your typography, logotype, and you know, really connecting them all. And that was it. Thank you. Thank you, Victor. That was great. Uh, excellent examples and insight. And you've mentioned the Designers Republic, and they're very special near and dear to my heart. We still have some time for questions. So if you have any, please raise your hand, and we'll get your microphone as quick as we can. No, really? Was that a hand? OK, then I guess I can start. I can give you one of mine. I'm curious about the difference in mindset and process because over time, now that the games are more sold in digital platforms, mm. I feel like the cover doesn't get to be as prominent as it used to be and it's often presented in different aspect ratios. Sometimes it's just a big header. Yeah. Do you, what, did they change your, the way you work? thinking about these things and how to present them. It, I think it definitely does. You know, you, you, you think of things like where, where, where does the logo sit in the image? Does it sit in the upper left and, you know, just readability? I think it's also like a reoccurring thing as you're developing key artists, putting too many things on the cover. If you have it like a tiny, tiny image in Steam or an Epic, it's like it just garbles into, you know, something. And sometimes you sort of have the temptation to like, put everything that the game is about into the cover and there's like 10 characters and you know different environments but but like you say if you look at it at, in a very small size then it's it's very hard to read so um, yeah I think it's 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 good to keep that in mind too for the digital era to keep it you know keep it more readable keep it kind of scalable to a smaller size um, working with color as well I had Super Mario Bros 3 uh, which is one of my favorite games but they have this you know it's just Mario against the yellow cover and I think Cyberpunk 2077 has a slightly similar approach with a character against a yellow background. And if you see that game, it's the yellow game, right? That it sort of stands out. So you can use color in pretty cool ways too and combine it with, with things like that. Um, and what I like uh, as well that many, many games and th that we did here too is kind of going from slightly more elements and complexity in a standard edition to progressively going more and more minimal. So, you, you know, you have your deluxe edition, it's just a Stormtrooper helmet, and then maybe the ultimate edition is just, you know, even less elements, so you can kind of, yeah, go more premium, go more luxurious, and collectors like the, the, more, the more expensive, like the, 
uh, the addition or the skew gets. We have one question, two questions, one at a time, please. Um, I'm curious about the icons that you can see on Steam and then on your, uh, for example, like PC. Uh, uh, is, is the same approach goes to creating those? Because they're uh, like so small. And yeah, they're so small. And it's a great question. Uh, I, I, I was going to talk more about it in this deck, but it's good that you asked the question so I can talk a bit about it now. Yeah, so iconography, uh, you know, it's a big challenge. Like, you're summarizing your game in 64 by 64 pixels. It's like, how do you do it? What, what do you pick? So, um, you know, um, you, you kind of have to find a symbol, um, something from the game that encapsulates it, it well. Um, like one example that I use is the creeper face from Minecraft. Like everyone knows the creeper face, and it's actually not even 64 by 64 pixels; it's 8 by 8 pixels. But it's become, you know, it's in the Minecraft logo, it's in the A on the logo, and you know, it's become an iconic image, right, for Minecraft. So you can take something that's super simple. Again, maybe coming back to Designers Republic, they work a lot with graphic design and simplicity as well. But you know, you can have that to communicate around. But it's hard. It's hard to do. It's hard to create icons as well because you have to go very minimal. Really, you know, find find the the essence again of like what it is that you you're wanting to communicate and how can it be used like broadly in that way. Just to answer this question. Um, that's something that I just noticed a few days ago. Is this something uh, that artists have to fix? The problem when you uh, put the icon on your, uh, the, the, how do you call it, the, piece, the screen the, on the PC work? Uh, desktop? Desktop, Def yeah. yeah. <laughs> Forgot the word. Sometimes you scale it and the icons get smaller, like this bug or something. Um, because uh, I, I remember creating the icons for like some mobile games and uh, you basically create a few resolutions of the same icon. Mm. Uh, but even on the PC, when uh, some bigger games, uh, when you uh, make the resolution of the icons like 200%, uh, 300% on your desktop, sometimes they don't scale at all and they just stay small or just scale down. Yeah. And is this like the some problem that's like, uh, like is this something that the artists like try to fix or is it just like programming uh, issue? It's, it's a good question. Um, I'm, I'm thinking back now, I, I've done a few PC icons for, I think it was for BF4. Um, for, so for consoles, it's actually a bit easier because you have set sizes, right? Like you have, you know, have a bigger one and you have the launcher and, and so on. But yeah, on PC, I think, like you say, like having different sizes that it scales between. I mean, you can also run into problems if you have a bigger res and then you scale it down, you know, natively. Um, but uh, I'd, I'd have to go and dig around a little bit. I don't have a, like a clear answer to like <laughs> how to fix it <laughs> right now. I think problem. I think you can fix it in in the art, uh, like from the art side, and then have it, you know scale with like how you slide it, like if you have it on your desktop. Because yeah, yeah. I can show you later, it's just like they have this screenshot and it's weird. Thank you. So first of all, thanks. Uh, thank you for the presentation and thanks for sharing your experiences. And my question would be, uh, you briefly touched on the logo and for example, battle, Battlefront logo was made just, ah, let's do it. But I know it's a complex topic, but can you, on the spot, can you share a few key points uh, how to make a good logo? Just um, spot some ideas, maybe. About yeah, that. absolutely. Okay. Um, yeah, no. So the, I mean, the Battlefront logo is, is a good uh, is a good example, even though it, it had to happen pretty quick. I think it was, you know, looking at Star Wars and like, okay, Return of the Jedi. Let, let's try this. Hopefully, it goes well. We're on, you know, heavy, heavy time pressure. Usually, you don't have that time pressure. You have you know, the development cycle of the game, you know, two, three, four, five, maybe years to, to develop it. Um, so my, my tips for, uh, for logotypes in general would be, one, to look at it in concurrence, like concurrently with typography, because generally you, you know, use complementary fonts or maybe even the same font. So whatever you're looking into for typography could probably translate into, into a logo. Uh, that's, that's how many, um, many folks do it. Um, 
And also, you know, um, sometimes the logotype isn't, uh, you know, uh, a, a text, but it's an Im uh, like it's more of a, an icon itself, right? So then, uh, you know, it's it sort of goes in in what what's the graphic design style for for the project that you're doing? Is it you know, uh, like wipeout? Is it more chunky? Is it about racing? It's got you know F1 maybe, and like it's got these connotations. Or if it's you know, uh, I don't know, say a, a more uh, adventurous RPG, and you're kind of leaning into uh, I don't know, certain elements, then it can be like, you know, maybe in the shape of a leaf, like, say you, I don't know, it's, it's an RPG about leaves, I don't know, I just came up with that. But you can have the shape of a leaf, right? You can study nature and like get those finer elements in. So, you know, it's nice to kind of tie to themes about what the game is and, you know, zeroing in on like an element and then exploring that. I hope that's a good answer. Sure. Thanks. Thanks. We have one question there. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> First of all, I want to thank you for your sharing. Um, the logos are very professional, and I deeply thank you. <laughs> thank you. Uh, I was wanting to ask you, do you have any guides or wishes from the marketing team on the clients or the investors? Do you have to protect your vision? Uh, do you... Mm, do you need to show the client's vision or do you have your own and things like that? Yeah, so, so, so the question is um, kind of sharing the vision with like other departments like marketing. Yeah. Yeah, um, yeah I mean, in, in, in the best, and I really like to work, I was going to say in the best of worlds, but I really like to work like this where you have a super tight collaboration with marketing and, you know, usually there's a brand design department. So um, uh, I try to do it a lot as a leader and a director where I, you know, get those two uh, departments to talk to each other. So it's like the UI is going off here and they're, I don't know, they're doing, you know, something else and then it's like red and something over, you know. So, and so, so it's fun. I think it's fun with collaboration, like, right? Like, I think that's what game development is about. It's a, it's a team sport and it's, you know, you can learn a lot from how other people in, you know, uh, any discipline does does things. Um, so I think, yeah, definitely like getting away from, from silos and developing your own different paths, but rather from an early stage, right? Like getting them to work together, getting the the, um, uh, the people from the, that work on the brand design marketing to play the game. That's also super important and doesn't always happen. So, you know, get them a build, get them a dev kit, get them to like, even if the game is uh, like we saw in the previous presentation, it's white boxy and, you know, it's uh, maybe it crashes a lot. It's still like, it gives other people an idea of what the game is going to be about. And they'll, you know, they'll come with their expertise and their talent. Um, in, in how to build, you know, um, marketing communications and working with, you know, branding elements and working with, uh, usually it's the UI UX team that, you know, touches this more in a, in a game development. Uh, also concept artists, 2D artists are involved. So I think, yeah, like finding, um, finding that collaboration, like for me, it really helps a lot. And it's, it's something I try to do in every project. This is what I wanted to hear. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. I see a couple more hands coming up, but we're out of time.